Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, and once upon a time, at, I was uh, at McGill. Um, anyway, it's a, a huge delight, in fact, a privilege and an honor uh, to be here uh, for John. Um, let's see, I've known John, I think, for almost 40 years now, and I remember the day that I met him uh, fairly clearly because he... Um, uh, he was at McGill. He, he had come to uh, have a meeting with uh, his uh, PhD co-advisor, Steve Zucker. At the time, I was a master's student at McGill. I think I had just started with Steve. So this must have been either 1980 or, or fall of 79, maybe. 78. 78? Well, then I was an undergrad. Uh, anyway, I, was, I, I walked into Steve's office, uh, or, or no, I was in Steve's office, and I think... John came uh, into the door, and, um, and so Steve introduced me. John, of course, was always smiling, uh, and he struck me like, immediately as like a very, very warm, friendly person, which I'm sure everyone here knows to be the truth. Um, and so I, I, I think we got to like each other from the beginning, and the next time I saw not the next time, but probably, well, sometime later I saw John as I was uh, graduating with my PhD degree, and so he visited MIT at the time, and I again uh, met up with him, and he, and he said, really, you ought, to, you ought to become a professor, he said, you ought to think of coming back to Canada. But at the time, you know, I was just kind of fed up with uh, universities altogether, and I wanted to go join the real world. Uh, so I, I wanted to go to California, Silicon Valley, and join a research lab over there, which I did. But I, um, three or four years later, uh, John lured me back. Um, and so really, I, I owe my academic career to John. Um, if, if he hadn't, um, you know, kind of come, come and said, really, you ought to become a professor, uh, joined the University of Toronto. We have the CIAR and all of that good stuff, uh, at least uh, back then. And so that was my, uh, my entry back into academia. And um, no regrets, John. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've, I've thanked him uh, before, and I'll, I'll thank him again here uh, that, you know, he... I, I owe my academic career to him. And um, so as, as time has been going on, um, so what, what I'd like to do is kind of give you um, uh, just like a, a, a glimpse into some of the work that, we, that we're doing. As, as we progress, we kind of converge closer and closer to what John has been thinking about all of these years in, in terms of research. Uh, in other words, uh, human human vision, uh, human active visions, uh, sensory motor control, uh, attention mechanisms, uh, things like that that we're really um, beginning to, to focus more and more on. So um, let's see. So the talk here is going to be about uh, biomimetic uh, human perception and sensory motor control. I, I'm going to try to build up to that. Uh, but first, I'd like to lay the, the context of this. So in the mid-1980s, after I'd done a PhD in, in computer vision, I began to get interested in computer graphics. And uh, it started off with physical simulation, but very quickly I became interested in um, biological simulation in computer graphics. Uh, so, I mean, it took about 20 years for physics to actually make it. Um, in the industry so that everybody's using it today, but uh, still we're maybe 10 to 20 years away from actually having um, biomimetic human uh, models, biomechanical simulation of, of human models in, uh, in computer graphics. So nowadays, um, characters like these human characters are becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous in the movies, but, and in, and in, um, and in uh, video games, of course, um, but the way they're animated today is by motion capture techniques. Um, and, you know, so, 
So these methods basically just capture the motion of the human body, of a real human body, and then transfer that motion signal to a, to a virtual character to animate the character. Um, 20 years ago or so, uh, people began to think about how to simulate a, a human character in a biomechanical way. And so this is uh, about 20-year-old technology now. Essentially, if you have an articulated human figure and you, um, and you put torque motors at the joints, then you can drive the joints and, and art, the articulated anthropomorphic figure can uh, be animated. So uh, going back to 2001, this is the work of uh, Petros Falutsos, who was a PhD student at the time at Toronto. I think his name is familiar at York University nowadays. And so he did this virtual stuntman that could be animated. Of course, that's not motion capture because you wouldn't want to do something like this, uh, you know, with a motion capture uh, set up anyway. So the, the way this works is you basically have a set of poses and the virtual character, the, the motors in the virtual character, which are rotational motors at the joints, are driving the joints uh, to, to hit all of these poses and interpolate physically in between the poses. And so you can create a number of uh, everyday movements, such as sitting and standing. And, um, and then you could build in uh, a set of controllers that um, can control the character. So this is a physically simulated character. There's gravity. It fell down, and now it's struggling to get back up again. So this is a, a control problem, basically. And um, you know, robot, robotics people have to face these kinds of problems. But if in the virtual world, you can simulate physics quite accurately these days. So I think this is every bit of as complex as the real world, um, you know, module some high level details, perhaps. But um, and, and robotics. Uh, characters like that. So th this was the state of the art maybe 10, 15 years ago. And um, of course, what's missing here is um, it, it's a very poor biomechanical model of the human body because, there are, first of all, there are no muscles. It, it's assuming that you know, the, the human body is like a robot that has rotational motors in it driving the joints. Meanwhile, uh, again, going back you know, uh, into the early 80s for, for facial modeling, you could see the difference in about 20 years here between 1981 and 2001 with the quality of uh, facial, human facial models. And very early on, these models had muscles in them in order to produce uh, the muscles of facial expression uh, to produce recognizable expression. So here on the left, you see an artist's drawing of uh, skin and underlying fatty tissues and muscles. So we have the epidermis, dermal, fatty layers, muscle layers, and more fat underneath. And then the muscles on the right are quite um, complicated, a set of musculature here. And the um, and so when one wants to build a biomechanical face model, first of all, we uh, simulate the skin. Let me see if I can get a laser pointer-like thing here. There we go. So we have a, a, simula a skin patch here, which is constructed out of um, finite elements type of models. These are like little, little prisms. And they attach together, sharing degrees of freedom. And then the muscles over here, so there are hundreds of muscles and there are, well, not hundreds, but many muscles in there. Um, all have Latin names and everything. And here we've abstracted them down to about uh, 36 or so muscle actuators. And then these are embedded into a, a facial model which is captured from a scan. And what you have is a working model of the human face that can produce expressions. By contracting the muscles, the, you know, it, the skin deforms. So here we're going to see a cross section through the head. And you can see as it turns around that we've got um, the, the skin and underlying layers and then the actuators in the back, which are contracting in a coordinated manner to uh, produce recognizable facial expressions. And so uh, one can apply a higher level controller here to coordinate the muscles, something like facial, uh, facial action coding system. 
And you could see from, from the exterior, so here the soft tissue simulation is producing deformations, including nasolabial furrows, um, and, and so on. So it, it, uh, well, the, the expressions are easily recognizable. So here it's just cycling through random expressions of random intensities and so on. So there are better models, of course, uh, nowadays of, uh, so this is a, that was a real-time model. Um, there are better models of skin and soft tissue in general, for, for example, that can be used for surgery simulations. So this is the work of Eftikios uh, Sifakis, who was a, a postdoc with my group for a time before he became a professor at the um, University of Wisconsin. And um, so that you, can, you, know, you could do um, uh, cranial facial surgery simulation with these better types of soft tissue models. So here's a, a common procedure for extracting a, a, like a tumor or something and then repairing the defect. So um, th that kind of is encouraging in the sense that you could, you could do a better job of biomechanical simulation both for soft tissues and, and muscle actuators. And so the task that um, my group, well, I, this was now maybe dating back to the early 2000s where we kind of began this work. But the idea was to come up, so this was a long-term project. Uh, the idea was to come up with a, a, a comprehensive, realistic biomechanical model of the human body. And you can see part of it here. Um, so on the left, you've got the muscle actuators. Um, so this is the musculoskeletal system over here. And you can render, we render the muscles in a realistic manner when we need to uh, put a skin on top of it. And then the model, it can be animated biomechanically. So I'd like to run quickly through the components here. We start with a skeletal, a skeletal system here. So you see here, here you see all the, um, the bones in the human skeleton. Um, they're color, different colors, so you could see them separately. So there are uh, quite a few bones here, like well over 100 bones. And, and so when you simulate, um, let's see, this should be going, no? I'm oh, sorry, uh, I think, I was making slides late last night, and this is some of them, so there are gonna be some bugs here. Uh, let me see if I can do that again. So without any muscles, of course, I think it'll hopefully just play by itself. And yeah, okay. So in, in the joints over here, you know, you've, for example, in the neck, you've got um, some uh, ligaments and discs, of course, and they have a passive elasticity to them and all of that. But gravity is always pulling downward, and so things just flop around when they're uncontrolled like this. So the, the task here, or the challenge, is to try to reproduce the human musculature, which is quite difficult to do. And if you, because, because uh, biology is perversely complicated, it seems, although I think there's a pretty good reason for that, which I'll, I'll get into later. But if you look at individual muscles, uh, it's, it's not an easy process to actually simulate all of this. You can see the hierarchical muscle structure here, uh, you know, going down from the, uh, the entire muscle itself to the various uh, sarcomeres down here, and then the contractile elements in the muscle it itself, which are distributed through the muscle body, and so on. You can get down to the kind of like the biochemical level if necessary. So it's a daunting t task to try to uh, simulate all of this, but if you hit the right level of abstraction, you can get some pretty, pretty good results out of it. So here, uh, for example, we have the Hill muscle model, which uh, I think nowadays is still state of the art. So Hill won the Nobel Prize for his work on um, elucidating um, the, the mechanical uh, work that muscles do. And so he came up with this model, which as you can see is a, uh, has a contractile element and then a series um, elastic uh, 
a series elastic element and a parallel elastic element. So this is a fairly simple model. Um, I guess most of the business here happens inside the contractile element, which I won't get into the details of. But this is known as the Hill muscle model. And um, this is what we use in our uh, human body simulation over here. So here you could see the detail of um, deep muscles in, uh, along the spine, um, which kind of emulate the uh, Gray's anatomy drawing on the left. And individual muscles, some of the longer muscles here are um, serial, se series connections of actuators. Um, each, each actuator here represented as a straight line, and you'll see this again and again, is, um, is one of these hill contractile actuators. And when you have broad muscles like this, like the latissimus muscle in the back, uh, we, we put a number of actuators together, as you can see on the right here, to, um, to try to approximate what this large uh, superficial muscle over here is doing. So looking at all the actuators in the upper body over here, you could see the complexity. And so there are quite a few of them. Um, overall, in the entire human body, our uh, human model over here has uh, over 800 actuators currently. And that's excluding the actuators that should go into the hands and feet, which we currently do not have, but that's something we'll be, uh, you know, we're planning to introduce as well into here. Uh, so this is a forward, this is a back view. And, and this could be rendered realistically, if necessary, by putting in the geometric models of the muscles. And so the actuators are running through these geometric models, and then um, they deform the geometric models, as, as you'll see in a minute. So here we could see the uh, geometry models of the muscles. So these are for visualization purposes, uh, again, with different colors, so they can be distinguished from, from the other. And on the left here, you see the superficial muscles. And then on the right, on the right they're stripped away. So you could see the deeper muscles underneath. And here's a back view of the model. And when you put a skin on top of it, you know, this is what it looks like. So the way this um, simulate, uh, what about the soft tissue simulation? Because we have the bones, we've got the muscle actuators. Um, in order to, to do the soft tissue simulation, basically we start with the skin geometry that we want to have, and then we create a, a lump of flesh uh, like this. And this is a tetrahedral lattice mesh on the order of seven millimeters um, over the body. And then we strip away by cutting away everything that's outside of the skin surface. And what's left on the inside is on the order of, uh, let's say, 4 million tetrahedral finite elements. And then we do some coarsening to reduce the number of elements, because this is, uh, you know, simulating that many elements is going to take a long time. Um, so we reduce this by uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, down to about uh, 300 or 400 uh, tetrahedral elements by combining elements on the... So we want to resolve the surface geometry, but the interior can be coarsened quite a lot. Then, this is a compromise. Um, how to put the actuators to, co um, to work within this lump of flesh. And so basically what we do is an embedding like this, kind of, where the muscle geometries are embedded into the, into the soft tissue finite element simulation, and the two are coupled together. So when the muscle actuator contracts, the, the visualization geomet geometry over here also contracts, and that produces traction forces on the uh, finite element simulation of the soft tissue, which makes the soft tissue contract. And all of this is uh, volume preserving because, you know, uh, Biological tissue is mostly water, and so you, it doesn't squeeze. It'll, when, you, when you squeeze it, it bulges out somewhere else, and that causes natural soft tissue deformations. So what you're going to see here is... Um, oops. Uh -oh. Well, that's, up. that's bad. Well, he was going to... Uh, I hope. 
Uh, I was throwing these slides together kind of last minute. Well, this is awful that it doesn't play. Um, but anyway, he, he uh, works with the dumbbells and, and you could see the interior also working. Um, so sorry about that, but here, here you can see what happens when you co-articulate muscles. Um, so you can you know, hold, hold uh, like a, bio, uh, like a um, isometric pose like this, and then you could tense the muscles like that to stiffen the system by co-articulating uh, agonist and at antagonist muscles simultaneously. And this causes natural uh, bulging, as you could see here, from zero core articulation to high core articulation. So this is a kind of a, a, a brief overview of the biomechanical model. And now, um, the, the way that what you haven't seen, that uh, uh, kind of exercise that was in the previous, <laughs> should have been the previous uh, videos was showing, was done using inverse dynamic, what's known as inverse dynamics. So the idea is, if you know what trajectory you want, let's say, any, any part of the body or even the entire human body to perform, you could do an inverse dynamics computation that determines what are the, mus the activations that have to be sent to the muscle actuators in order to, uh, to, to make that movement, to track that known movement. Uh, and so that's, that involves optimization and uh, kind of an elaborate uh, numerical technique for doing that kind of thing and it's not real time and it's not to totally not biologically plausible because the, the brain doesn't work in that way. Um, but anyway, that's known as um, inverse dynamics. It's, uh, you know, I guess you're all familiar with inverse kinematics. The idea is if you have an articulated skeleton and you have motion capture data, you use inverse kinematics or IK to track the motion capture data with the articulated skeleton, and that converts the positions, the known, let's say, the estimated positions of uh, uh, reflective markers on the body um, into joint angles by tracking those markers using an uh, inverse kinematics on an articulated skeleton. So inverse dynamics goes a step beyond that where you're trying to determine what are the muscle forces that are required to, to take a, a biomechanical model and make it perform the same movement. So um, anyway, bear, bearing that in mind, uh, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that later. So with a human uh, model like this, we can do all kinds of interesting things. So the, one of the first things we try doing that's pretty sophisticated is creating a human swimmer with this model. So here you see it embedded or uh, immersed, I should say, in a, in a virtual fluid. And uh, OK, so, I, so basically the, the human body with uh, all of its muscles and the soft tissue um, uh, immersed in a Navier-Stokes simulated fluid. And, the, and what we're trying to do here is produce swimming motions. So this, these locomotion, including uh, terrestrial locomotion, bipedal locomotion, and swimming in water is um, periodic. That's the only way you know, to make forward progress indefinitely, just repeat some kind of action that pushes you along, whether it's by foot or by uh, arms and legs in a fluid. And the, the natural way for doing this is what's known as uh, central pattern generators, which are neural circuits that are um, in the spinal, you know, at the spinal level that um, actuate skeletal muscles here repeatedly in a rhythmic pattern to produce um, rhythmic motions. So here we see, um, okay, so here we have the central pattern generator sort of at the spinal level and the higher level controller in the brain over here is basically modulating that rhythmic pattern, uh, increasing the frequency, amplitude, and changing the phase basically to produce you know, movements that are you know, together like this or opposite and so on. And so our human swimmer here is capable of producing various different strokes like this, again with a high level setting, you know, uh, control of the parameters. And you can see how it compares with some live footage, 
So this, the, the timing here is timed to this particular video sequence. So this, this is a butterfly simulation, and again, comparing with real footage. And um, transitions are pretty easy here because it's a, it's a physical system. So the model can speed up, slow down, um, and even uh, change styles on the fly. So here you see, a, I guess, a butterfly. And uh, the brain says, OK, now let's do um, freestyle. And it just very naturally um, transitions over to a freestyle movement. And the physics takes care of the interpolation process, so it, you know everything looks natural. So this is kind of like the way it, it works in the, with the human um, uh, brain, you know, controlling. Okay, let's not worry about that one. So what we have here is a multi-physics simulation that involves um, three different components. You've got the uh, simulation of the rigid articulated body bones, you know, so that's a um, articulated multi-body simulation simulator doing that. Then you've got the deformable soft body simulation for the flesh. That's a Lagrangian finite element uh, type of elastic simulation. Finally, you've got the fluid simulation, which, in, which is an Olerian um, uh, Navier-Stokes type of simulation going on. So these are three um, specialized simulators exchanging forces in an interleaved manner. So you take a step with one, you send the forces to the other, and, and uh, rotate round and round, you know, doing all of this together. Uh, so, you know, I think that's pretty much... Uh, so here, here you can see the musculoskeletal system, okay, the muscles on top of it, the skin, and finally the fluid uh, all together to produce the movement. So this is pretty much uh, state of the art uh, nowadays in, in computer graphic simulation. I think you know, this is actually beyond the state of the art. Uh, but anyway, the community will, will catch up to this at some point. Now, let me, <laughs> let me um, move on to really what, what is the main topic here. And how much time do I have left? Zero. Don't say zero. OK. Huh? <laughs> I don't know how, how do count how late we started. Okay, but I, I thought I had, uh, I think I have an hour and, uh, yeah, so probably I'll, yeah. Probably here though, isn't it? Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh finally. <laughs> I'll drink to that. <laughs> okay, so uh, and now we get to something really interesting. Well, okay, so first of all, let's, let's look at the head. So the neck head complex, or um, cervicocephalic or cephalic as it's known uh, scientifically, the subcomplex in the human body. So if you look at the again the Gray's anatomy uh, here drawings, you see that this perverse complexity of the musculature it's so complicated and many many muscles at, at various different layers, and one wonders why why is biology so darned perverse to, I mean, uh, robotics people try to minimize the number of uh, joints, the number of motors, because these things break down a lot. But biology seems to be going the opposite way, trying to complicate matters as much as possible. Um, I think the reason for this, well, two reasons. One is that you get much more flexibility in the motion. And secondly, uh, believe it or not, the control problem becomes easier, not harder, when you've got tons of muscles. <laughs> To, to deal with, and um, I can I hopefully explain why. So here, okay, so here we have the skeletal model for this uh, su subpart of the body. We've got seven cervical vertebrae here in a skull. E each of these is three degree of freedom joints along the uh, cervical column over here, and of course there are ligaments and discs which are you know provide some passive elasticity. Like take a chicken. A raw chicken neck, you know, and bend it, and you'll see that it springs back to its natural shape uh, passively. Um, so the equations of motion here are the equations for a multi-body system. Um, let's not worry about the details here. But if you if you turn on a physics simulator, uh, of course, this is what's going to happen. The mass of the head is just going to collapse 
down. And um, what you need, of course, are the muscle actuators that through the appropriate um, here, neural input. So this is the afferent neural signal that goes into each of the individual muscle actuators. Uh, if, you, if you provide the right signals to the muscles, of course, from the brain, then um, the muscles can hold the head up against the downward pull of gravity and produce um, controlled head movements like all of us are doing all the time, which, of course, is very important for perception as well. So here in our model, we have 72 neck muscles um, with this um, more simplified model, 48 deep muscles, 12 intermediate muscles, and 12 long superficial muscles. So the superficial muscles are connecting, as you can see from the back of the skull up here, down, down to the shoulder area, uh, area over here, the clavicle and, and so on, bones. And this, this is very important for controlling the system, that a, mu a muscle goes from point to point, contractile, and spans multiple joints. So it's not like having torque motors at each of the joints. So my student who did this, uh, Sung Hee Lee, who um, now professor in his homeland, Korea, um, and he also built the, the entire human body model that I showed you earlier. Um, he, his background was robotics, and when he was doing his PhD, the first thing he tried um, was to actually do a top type of, uh, robotics type of um, solution to this problem, but it failed because it's very difficult to control a multi-body system like this with torque motors at the joints. But if you put in point-to-point -point actuators redundantly like that, many actuators, and this is anatomically correct. Um, so here, for example, is uh, a Leonardo da Vinci drawing from whatever, uh, 1500s or something. And here's our biomechanical model, so you can see the similarities here. So the, the, these muscles, the positioning, the attachments, and the searching points are all uh, anatomically accurate. So um, is there, there going to be any audio on this, by, by the way? Let's, uh, let's give it a try. Once upon a time, okay, there lived an expressive face named Pat. One day, Pat found seven vertebrae and a skull that fit nicely. I should now be able to turn my head, Pat thought, but gravity prevailed. As the blood rushed to Pat's head, Pat became introspective. That's it, Pat realized. I can control my head using muscles. Attaching 72 neck muscles activated by trained neural networks, Pat could now turn at will. This changed Pat's life. Pat could enjoy riding a wagon, playing soccer, and even talking to friends. And they all lived happily ever after. Okay. <laughs> You've got to do these kinds of things for SIGGRAPH. Uh, so, a part of the control problem here is maintaining uh, control over stiffness. Um, so you've got muscles usually in agonist-antagonist pairs, and the co-contraction of the muscles creates, you know, uh, a stiff or unstiff biomechanical system. So here you could see with perturbations, um, with low stiffness, the head, you get a, uh, a, a wobbly head type of thing. And when the stiffness um, is increased, so the muscles are co-contracting, then it's, uh, well, much more, it doesn't, perturb as much. Or uh, in this situation, with uh, the deflection force from the soccer ball, uh, the perturbation is quite high, but if you stiffen the system by co-contracting co muscles appropriately, then the deflection is much smaller. So as the video um, said, uh, well, okay, so the controller here is a neuromuscular controller. I talked about neural networks. So here, here we could see um, the, the entire system. So we've got a, a skeletal system that we've already seen um, with muscles and a biomechanical face model. And then we have two levels of controller, a low-level reflex controller and a high-level voluntary controller. The system is, produces proprioceptive feedback to the muscles. And then the voluntary controller basically says what, it, you know, what uh, the uh, simulated human wants to do. And the reflex controllers 
provide the actual muscle, final muscle activation levels to each of the actuators in the body. And of course, the muscle contraction forces cause articulation in the skeletal system, which uh, you know, is situated in, in a physical environment with gravity and applied forces and all of that. And of course, the head pose uh, modifies the direction the face is looking at and the eyes and so on. But what I want to get into next is this um, neural, um, neural, basically um, neuromuscular control mechanisms that are at work over here controlling the entire system. So we all know what neural networks are. I won't bother with this. Uh, simple processing units connected uh, in, in uh, multiple layers. This system is actually trained in a natural way. So if, if you try to actually, well, first of all, inverse dynamics is no good for running this because it's an offline process. And, and it's not biologically plausible that the brain is doing something like inverse dynamics. What the brain is doing, well, what the body is doing is forward dynamics, and the brain is controlling the forward dynamics to, to control the movement. So how, and, and of course, there's a, there, there are neurons up here that are uh, doing this at the, in, in the motor centers of the brain. And so what we need to do is uh, emulate all of that process. But how do we create a, a neuromuscular controller that can control all the muscles and train it up properly so they can do the right job online in real time um, as, uh, as happens in, in the physical world? So let's, uh, here's one way to do it. Let's say you, you put a visual target in front of this character. Um, what you want the, the head to do, of course, is to rotate to look at, the, at this visual target. So if you just simply rotate the head, you can figure out what the muscle lengths should be to have that head looking in a particular direction. And so this is done by inverse kinematics. Inverse dynamics, because there's gravity, with inverse dynamics you could say, well, what are the muscle forces that have to be acting on, on this system in order to support the head so that it doesn't collapse due to the pull of gravity. So this gives you the required um, muscle activations that you need to have. So essentially what you have is an input-output function over here. The input is the direction of the gaze, well, uh, well no, the way the, where the nose is pointed to, let's say, and the output is the desired muscle activations that have to go to each of the muscles to hold the head against gravity in, in that position. So this is a way of having the model actually generate its own training data. And this is done offline by, by doing solving inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics computations offline. And then you could create infinite quantities, if you wish, of training data and feed these, uh, these training data to a neural network so here with 20,000 random, well, I'm not going to show all 20,000 of them, but with 20,000 random um, positions of the visual target, you could generate enough training data to cover sort of the, the space. And what is a neural network doing in a situation like this? It's, it's trivially simple. It's just an, a nonlinear regressor. Um, so the uh, input over here on the x-axis is the target pose. The output is the muscle activations. So depending on how many muscles there are, over, so this, okay, let's say two-dimensional space down here, uh, theta and phi angles, and over here you have as many muscles as are in the system over here. So this is uh, what the neural network does is some sort of nonlinear regression over here. So um, in between then, you, you know what you should get by querying this uh, approximator over here, you can say, okay, for any given target pose, I should be able to estimate what my desired muscle activation sh should be to, to achieve that pose. And um, interpolation comes pretty naturally. So the end result of having trained the model in this fashion is that it works online and can then track a visual target um, by doing head rotations. And we have a simple eye rotation mechanism here as well to uh, make it all look natural. But the point is that this neural network learns on its own, uh, the voluntary controller learns on its own by uh, synthesizing its own training data and, uh, and then is, is capable of, of doing all these things. The problem, however, is 
um, you have to train it for various different things. So for example, here, if you tilt the shoulders, if we train the model with horizontal shoulders, now we tilt the shoulders, um, it doesn't have that, it, it hasn't seen that situation before, so it fails at some point like this. Uh, the, the, and the problem is that shallow networks, so this, this was done in the um, earlier, uh, well, 2005 time frame, kind of before deep learning made the scene. The problem is, as you give it more and more training data, these shallow networks, they just uh, kind of uh, asymptotically, you know, they don't learn any, anymore from more and more training data. They just, uh, you know, they reach their capacity. So what you need is deeper networks. And so we started look at, looking at deep learning as a way of doing this kind of thing. And this, uh, of course, is very capable of learning from much more training data. So now, okay, it can handle different shoulder rotations uh, like that as well. Okay. Um, anyway, so here what we have is, um, you know, in this little uh, clip from the movie, um, it looks like they're observing each other, but really there's no vision system here going on. It's kind of a simulated vision in the sense that the positions of these various characters are known to each other where they are in 3D space. So there really isn't any biomimetic vision happening here. But um, what we've been working on recently is a whole uh, biomimetic sensory motor control system, which, is, uh, which uses deep learning throughout. So it has a perception subsystem up here with eyes capable of eye movements, retinas with foveated photoreceptor distributions, and 10 deep neural networks that um, uh, support the perception that's going on over here. Meanwhile, the motor system below has another 10 deep neural, deep neural network neuromuscular controllers. Um, one of them controls the, the head neck subsystem, which is 216 muscles in this particular model. And then the four limbs, uh, each of the arms has 29 muscles and each of the legs has 39 muscles. So you can see these are kind of separated right here because uh, currently what we have is uh, the spine immobilized uh, along with the pelvis and what's free to move are the arms, legs, and uh, the, the head can move around and the eyes, of course, within the head. So, the, so what this system, so here it's seated, uh, what it's capable of doing is, um, well, what you just saw. <laughs> There's a visual target. It could see where the visual target is, as I'll explain in a minute, and can reach out and, re and hit that target. Now, here you can see with the deactivated muscle controllers and then reactivated, you know, it comes back. Deactivated, it's swinging around. Reactivated, it comes back up and reaches. So let's look at this uh, system overview over here. So first of all, we have a physical environment. Within the physical environment, we have the virtu virtual human. This has eyes in it that, are cap that have the ability to see um, with uh, vision. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then the muscle system is controlled. The so again, we have high-level voluntary controller and low-level reflex controller. Um, and each of these controllers is a neural network. So the low-level reflex controller, here you could see the neural network down below. What, it, what comes in here is the um, muscle strain and strain rate, and what comes out is the change in muscle activation. So this modifies current muscle activation. At the higher level, we've got a, um, a, set, of, um, a, a set of voluntary controllers. So for example, for the head, what you have is a desired uh, head orientation plus the current activation to the muscles. And what comes out is how these muscles activations have to be modified to reach um, whatever visual target is out there. And the same with the limbs. Over here, the limb, you know, if it wants to reach a position in space, X, Y, Z, it, um, you've got, you know, the current muscle activations, the desired, the error between where you are and where you want to be, and then the change in muscle activations as an output. Again, this, um, these neural networks are trained by offline training data synthesis through the simulated model itself. 
So for example, for the arm over here, we set, let's say the, we want to reach that visual target. There's an error vector between where we are and where we want to be. So let's first of all do inverse kinematics to move us incrementally to that position, then inverse dynamics, muscle optimization, let me not go through the details of this, and then uh, this pushes the system closer towards the goal. Um, and this is repeated. So this creates training data. So you put a visual, you know, you put a, um, a, uh, a goal position, the arm can uh, train, its own, train itself to actually incrementally reach, reach that position over time. So with the untrained neuromuscular controllers, the system is wildly out of control, as you could see here, right? Can't do anything. But as you train up the system, you could see how it gets better and better after you know, several epochs. Uh, well, sorry, I guess that didn't play properly. Let's see if we can do this again. OK, so here, here you see the training. Um, so at first, it's not very capable. And you can see as the epochs, uh, training epochs go to 25 up to several hundred, it becomes better and better at reaching a visual target. Until finally, uh, here's the final trained um, left arm neuromuscular controller. So that's for the motor control side of things. What about the perception side? OK, well, again, we're trying to do a biomimetic vision, vision system here for this virtual human. And so the idea is we need a set of perception deep neural networks to uh, figure out what's going on visually. The, their eyes in the head and are capable of eye movements. And then um, once you look at a visual target, then you can estimate where the position of that visual target is visually from where your um, end effect or the, the hand is, for example. And then the, the, the um, Target error vector is sent, the estimated target error vector is sent down to the motor control level to actuate the, um, the, the head neck system plus the limbs. So looking at the eye itself, okay, so now we've got the challenge of how to um, model all of this, you know, the eye and the retina. Now, of course, uh, biological eyes are, they don't have a uniform distribution of photoreceptors like uh, regular cameras do. So we need to simulate that. Um, uh, I guess you're all familiar with uh, log polar distribution of, uh, you know, a, a photoreceptor type of models. So here we have a noisy log polar distribution. So each uh, dark point, so this is the, the retina at the back of the eyeball. Each position over here, the dark uh, points, represent the location of, let's call them cones, okay, for lack of a better name. Um, so it's a foveated retina, high density in the middle here and lower density out to the peripheral area. How do we determine what is the um, irradiance that um, is uh, captured by each of these photoreceptors on the retina? Well, through ray tracing, a computer graphics technique. Um, you shoot out rays from the position of the photoreceptor through, in this case, it's a pinhole eye model. So it goes through the pinhole and then hits the visual world out there, bounces in the visual world. And when it's a recursive process, when the, the ray is evaluated back, it tells you what is the light intensity that um, is impinging on that particular photoreceptor. So here you could see it's looking around um, and you can see the rays sort of coming out um, sampling uh, the, the, the light field out there. And the first thing we need to learn is foveation control. So for example, if you see a visual target out here, can, can we make the eye rotate to look at that visual target? And this happens pretty quickly. So here's the white ball, and you can see it comes in from the peripheral, uh, in the periphery, and then the eye quickly rotates to foveate the white ball. So the, um, the perception controllers have this kind of architecture. I should have mentioned for the motor controllers, it was a, a fully connected deep neural network 
with multiple layers, you know, six layers and so on. So we tried to maintain the same architecture. This was done through extensive uh, experimentation of various different options here, and this is the architecture we came to. So for example, what we have here as the input to the neural network is not an image of any kind. It's just a one-dimensional vector, which is the optical, uh, you know, the optical nerve coming out of the eye, which says, you know, here's photoreceptor 1 through n, and this is the response, the light intensity that this photoreceptor is picking up. Here, you know, it's an optic nerve. It's just a fiber bundle. Now deal with it. Okay, so what we want out of this, let's say for the head, neck system is, you know, well, for the eye, I should say, is a rotation. So we want, you know, if the photoreceptors towards the periphery are stimulated, this uh, neural network over here has to learn how to, where to rotate the eye so that it looks at that uh, stimulus. And, uh, you know, that we do, again, by training it up with training data that, that's simulated by the model. So the end result of all of this is something like this, where you could shoot a visual, uh, you could shoot a, a visual target, let's say, at the uh, at this human. You could see the what the left and right retinas are seeing up there, um, and of course the the head and the li uh, the limbs are being controlled through the muscles to uh, look at the visual target as it comes in, and then reach out and intercept the incoming target. If you like more graphics, you know. Something like this is uh, kind of what we can see. So that's, this is just eye candy. And it's um, pretty capable of uh, controlling itself in a very natural manner. There's no like high level controller here that says, you know, do well. I mean, there, there is the part about which arm do I reach out with for doing this, but there, there's, there's nothing really fancy going on here. It's just these. 20 deep neural networks co cooperating together in an asynchronous matter, manner to, pre to uh, achieve this um, full sensory motor control. Because look closely at what the eyes and the head are doing here um, as it tracks that visual target and reaches out. Okay. And then, well, of course, it's capable of doing things like drawing. If you give it a kind of like a known trajectory, it has to follow with the finger. It can do that quite well, or uh, like that, okay? Or to write. <laughs> so this stuff is so, so new that I was making slides yesterday. Um, five hours ago, or maybe six hours ago. And, and the system is quite robust, I mean, surprisingly. Um, even though we trained the model, you know, standing up, upright, if we lean it back in a chair like this, it's still able to draw. So it's, you know, reasonably robust without any extra training, and if, you know, we could train it with various different orientations and so on. So what's our current work in all of this? Well, first of all, we need to, there are lots of things to do. I mean, this opens up a, uh, you know, a whole <laughs> treasure chest of uh, stuff to look at. First of all, we need a, a better, more detailed biomechanical model of the eye, including all the, um, the, the, the six um, extraocular muscles that control the eyeball over here. Let's not go into the details, but we do have a detailed geometric model like this that we're using currently. And, you know, we've, we've got, well, first of all, the eye is not a pinhole camera. It's got, it, it's got an, um, uh, a finite aperture, uh, the pupil, which is controlled by the iris that can do automatic gain control with the amount of light. The iris itself has its uh, muscle around that, you know, dilates, dilates the eye. And, um, and so what, what one has to do is a more sophisticated ray tracing type of uh, operation there. So basically, um, each photoreceptor has to shoot not just a single ray through the pinhole, but a uh, multiple rays going out, sampling the uh, finite uh, aperture itself, and then hitting the world out there and bringing back and averaging all that, um, all that uh, light intensity information. So this allows you to do depth of field and of course to have a lens that can, um, that can deform, that can then focus 
at different depths. So all of that is perfectly possible, uh, well known how to do that kind of stuff thanks to computer graphics people. And so this needs to be incorporated into it. But we, f we still need to do uh, eye muscle, uh, well, to control the eye muscle. So we're well, well in, uh, in the process of that. There's a paper that's coming out that we're currently writing that shows how we can actually control the, the inter extraocular muscles and all of that and have the appropriate uh, perception controllers for just the, uh, the eye sensory motor subsystem. Uh, in addition, we want to put in a vestibular system so that uh, you know the, the head could have an orientation, knows what its orientation is in space from kind of inner ear type of sensors. And then everything should be tied together with a tension mechanism. So this is where John's work uh, is hopefully going to come in because we need, you know, uh, here what we saw so far is just pretty much a single visual target. But if you have multiple visual targets, then you, you need attention mechanisms and focus of attention to be able to uh, pick out visual targets and track them and so on. So this has to come in. And of course, we're looking for neural network types of mechanisms to make all of this, um, to implement all of this. So I just want to leave you with a kind of teaser over here of uh, eventually what we want to get is a, a full, also I should say that we have the torso now working with its own uh, set, set of neural networks so we can um, at least it could kind of support itself sitting down and eventually should be able to stand up and walk around and do other things and balance properly. So that's kind of where we're going with all of this. So this pretty much concludes my talk. I just want to acknowledge the uh, really amazing work of uh, several PhD students um, over, over the years, dating back to actually the early um, uh, 2000s when Sung, Sung Hee built the uh, human biomechanical model and looked at the, the cervicocephalic uh, control subsystem, uh, an initial attempt at that, that kind of gave us um, the courage, let's say, to, to kind of move on and model the entire human body and then deal with the control problems that are uh, necessary to, to deal with over here. And um, more so Justin C. did the uh, human swimmer, and more, most recently, Masaki Nakata uh, did the deep learning of the neuromuscular and sensory motor controller, and um, Tao Zhu is going to take over. Masaki is currently a postdoc working with me after completing his PhD, and then Tao will take over from that, and we're going to be doing you know, the walking human balancing and all of that. And, uh, of course, I should forget Eftikios uh, Sifakis with the soft tissue simulation. All of that will be integrated in. So anyway, this is going to keep us busy for years to come doing all of that. But um, I should say again that John has been an inspiration over these years. Uh, just looking, you know, by, by looking at biological vision and control, um, control mechanisms, uh, of course, with various robotic systems, I would like to say that, you know, Many people are working with robots. It's important to work with robots if you want to do anything in the real physical world. But if you want to study human um, perception, um, motor control, and sensory motor control loops, I would advocate to uh, do simulated humans because it, on the graphic side uh, and the simulation side, it's, it's, it's come of age now so that we can do m more, much more biomimetic uh, simulated biomimetic models, then we can actually build anthropomorphic biomimetic physical robots. So I think this, this is the way to go for the time being. Okay, thank you very much.